This is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. We're going to talk about the last days, lack of charity. So 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 1 says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So Paul spoke more than one language. He spoke Hebrew, which is the tongue of angels. However, with all these gifts and talent, he knew these things weren't worth anything if he didn't have charity. He would be just a sounding brass and tingling cymbal. A preacher may be a great orator and be able to move the crowd with a good delivery and technique, but without charity, it profits him nothing. Now verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So Paul had the gift of prophecy, and he prophesied to us in his epistles. He understood all mysteries, and he revealed these to us. He had a vast amount of knowledge and faith, so much faith that he could remove mountains, as Jesus himself spoke of. However, if he lacked charity, it was all nothing, and he was nothing. But the last days we're living in today do not have charity, but actually boasts of gifts that they do not have. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 2, it says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. But you see in that verse, men are lovers of their own selves self-promoters it's all about their ministry and their ministry is for their glory alone and every time they preach or teach it is just to get their name out there more they don't show charity they don't have love and care for other members of the body of christ so how does benny hen and td jakes and joel osteen and beth moore and paula white and all these other crooks get up every sunday and take people's money they lack charity and their God is their belly. They profess to be godly, but their heart is just filthy and dark. That's how they're able to just rob people in the name of God every time they open their mouth. 1 Corinthians 13.3 says, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. In the last days you can't get men to feed their families, let alone feed the poor. Because they're lovers of their own selves. You see many celebrities and athletes who have all this money. So they would donate so much money to the poor. This is the world's idea of charity. Of course it gets highly publicized and helps their image. But what is the reason that they're doing it? Do you feed the poor saints? Do you do, you do it with the right motive? Is it for yourself? Is it for the Lord? Or is it for yourself and bragging rights? Or just for the main reason of getting something for yourself. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. At the judgment seat of Christ, it is based on what sort is it. What was your motive for doing the good work A man can feed the poor and give his body to be burned, dying as a martyr, and if he doesn't do it with charity, then it profits him nothing. And I don't believe we're going through the tribulation. However, there is nothing that says you won't be in a situation where you could die as a martyr. And if you're ever in that situation, then what will your motive be in dying as a martyr for the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, Paul is going to give you some descriptions of what charity looks like. In verse 4 he says, Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Uh, men in the last days, as Second Timothy 3 says, are lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Suffereth really isn't in their vocab vocabulary, that word suffer. Someone who has charity is long-suffering. 
And if a man follows in the steps of Jesus Christ, then he is long-suffering. How quick are you to write someone off and turn them away? If the Lord puts up with your nonsense day in and day out, then you should be able to put up with your brother and sister in Christ's nonsense day in and day out. Even the ones who are annoying and hard to be around. Now verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. In 2 Timothy 3.3, 3, a last day's description shows us that men in the last days will be fierce and not kind. So are you one of those people who people hate to be around? Do you pitch a fit if someone has your seat or has something out of place? When someone asks you a question, is everything that comes out of your mouth a smart aleck answer? Charity is kind. And James 3.17 says, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Is that you? Are you showing charity when you speak to somebody? But verse 4 in 1 Corinthians 3, Charity suffereth long and is kind, charity envieth not. 2 Timothy 3 describes me in the last days as being unthankful. If you envy someone, then you're unthankful and not content with what God's given you in your life. If you have charity towards a brother and he begins to be successful with a nice house and a nice car and a good job and a nice-looking wife, you will be happy for him. If his ministry begins to be successful and he gets thousands of followers, then you will be happy for him. If you don't have charity, then you will envy him. This will make you criticize him because you think you deserve what he has. And many parents are like this towards their own kids. As a parent, you should be happy if your child's success in the, in the Lord. You should be happy with it and not jealous and envious. Verse 4, Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. And that is something different than what you see today in these last days. Lack of charity. 2 Timothy 3, 2, For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Charity does not draw attention to self. If you show love to others, then you aren't going to bring up what you did in the future. And in the future, you're not going to boast of your greatness and love that you've shown. Charity vaunteth not itself. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Someone who is a good example of Christian charity will not behave themselves unseemly. That is, in a way that a Christian shouldn't behave themselves. And I know countless Christians who have behaved like the world in the world, and they ru ruin their testimony, and led lost people down the wrong road, and younger Christians down the wrong road. And they think that they're just hurting themselves. But Romans 14, 7 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. It's not showing love and care to younger Christians when you behave yourself unseemly in front of them and lead them down a wrong road. The saying, I'm not hurting anyone but myself, is a very untrue statement because you're always hurting somebody else. Now verse 5, Doth not behave itself unseemly, Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Christians today are selfies who love their own self. They seek their own. They want to be first in line. If they were on a sinking ship and there was one lifeboat left, they would probably kill everybody to get it. They will run over a toddler with a buggy on Black Friday. They will blow the horn at you at the red light if you do. If you just if you're sitting there to a, half a second too long, they'll blow the horn when it turns green. Uh, if McDonald's only had one McRib left in stock, they wouldn't let your hungry daughter have it. They have no charity. Just every little everyday things that comes up in life, you can see that somebody lacks any type of compassion on somebody else. Charity doesn't seek her own. Have you ever been around someone who has always had to have it their way? You can be driving in the car with them and it's supper time and they refuse to eat anywhere but where they want to eat. 
then if you don't give in to their immaturity every time and eat where you where you want, then they will just sit in the car and pout while you go in and eat. They won't have it any way but their way. If you, out of one time out of a hundred, decide you're going to do it your way, then they'll just give you the silent treatment and pout and sit in the car. That is seeking their own. 1 Corinthians 10.24 says that no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Uh, Romans 15.3, For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. And a common saying for people today is, love yourself first. And that's a bunch of nonsense. Or they'll say, as long as you're happy, wrong again. Or you have to put yourself first. Once again, wrong. And the devil told you these cute little sayings. But they are far from what the Bible actually says. The scripture teaches God first. Other people second. And you dead last. Anything that teaches love yourself first. And that uh, as long as you're happy and put yourself first. All those are the wisdom of the world. That's not the wisdom of God. Philippians 2, 3 through 7 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took on him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So even the Lord Jesus Christ left heaven and came down to serve others. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, 5, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. So charity doesn't fly off the handle. James 1, 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, Slow to speak, slow to wrath. Be slow to wrath and think no evil. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. So if you have charity... Then you're going to keep your thought life in subjection. 2 Corinthians 10.5 Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So if you're thinking lustful thoughts about all your sisters in Christ, then that's not charity. Looking at them in that way shows you're lacking love and care for them. And if you treat the women in your life as if they are your mother or your sister or your daughter, then you will be less likely to lust. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2 says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. The perverted minds of men have been warped and desensitized through pornography, it's not safe for our wives and daughters to walk down the street anymore. And if you want to be a peculiar person for the Lord, then make a covenant with your eyes. Keep your thoughts in subjection. If you can see women as your mother or sister or daughter, depending on their age and your age, then you will be less likely to sin. 1 Corinthians 13.6 Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Charity does not rejoice in iniquity. 2 Timothy 3, 2 says, Men in the last days are unholy. And we are living in a time when even Christians rejoice in iniquity. They aren't upset by sin in the slightest bit. Now this is a big one. Many times there is that Christian that just seems to have it all. And this causes other Christians to get jealous. And maybe this Christian's ministry has thousands of followers. And the other Christian looks at him and says, I'm, I'm just as good as him. Why don't I have that many followers? Or something like that. Then when that Christian drifts off into some kind of sin, this 
jealous Christian rejoice, rejoices and revels in that other Christian's sin because he feels like this gives him the upper hand in being the greatest. But this isn't charity. You're rejoicing in his iniquity because of your envy towards him. And if you love your brother, then rejoice in his success and his righteousness. If he messes up, then pray for him. As it says in Galatians 6, 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So if you have charity, you won't rejoice in iniquity. You won't rejoice in seeing your brother or sister in Christ fall into sin, but you'll actually rejoice in the truth. And if you rejoice in truth, then you'll be rejoicing in the word of God. Jesus said himself, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth in John 17, 17. And a Bible corrector doesn't rejoice in truth because he seeks to change the truth. He rejoices in iniquity. He rejoices in his own smarts and intellect. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So a Christian with good charity will bear burdens. Galatians 6, 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. So if you bear one another's burdens, then when your brother or sister is going through something, you're right there with them. You're rejoicing with those that do rejoice and weeping with those that weep. And compare it to your, your physical body. The Lord compares the body of Christ to a man's physical body. When you hit your toe on the door, you pick up your toe with your hand and you're... You know, you're, you're putting pressure on it and everything else. Other parts of your body gets involved when you stub your toe. And your hand is in mourning with your foot when you stub your toe. Just like the body of Christ, you've got all of these members in the body. When one member gets hurt, another member gets hurt. Because you're rejoicing with those that do rejoice and you're weeping with those that weep. And if you love the Lord, and you'll believe His words. And you'll have your hope in the promise of His coming during these last days of the church age. Looking to the Bible for how to act, how to have charity, how to be with another Christian. You want to be there for your, your brothers and sisters in Christ and not just on the sidelines watching them and then laughing at them when they fall. People are not rejoicing when their brothers and sisters rejoice and weeping with them that weep. As it said in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 12, and whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Titus 2.13 says, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's our hope. Charity has hope. It hopeth all things. Endureth all things. As a Christian, you're going to suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you're going to suffer from chastening from God when you sin. Uh, Hebrews 12.7 says, If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as sons, for what son is he of whom the Father chasteneth not? So you're going to suffer with your brothers and sisters when they suffer, and if you have charity, you will endure these things and not give up. You're going to endure the chastening, and you'll just come out better. 1 Corinthians 13, 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So charity never fails, but prophecies will. Because one of these days we will be in eternity. And all the prophecy you read in this book will be fulfilled. And even in the millennium, a man isn't even supposed to prophesy. As it says in Zechariah 13.3, 
And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live. For thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord, and his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. So that day's coming. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Uh, charity never faileth. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. So the gift of tongues will cease because it is a sign gift to the unbelieving Jews. Right now the Lord is dealing with the church, not the Jew. Knowledge will vanish away. It's good to study and get knowledge of the Bible, but all the things you learn now won't matter when you get your glorified body. You will have a mind like the Lord Jesus Christ. Sure, of course, we're getting rewards for all the time we've studied and read the Bible. But there's coming a time when you're going to know everything you know now and know way more than that. You're going to have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. Charity is greater than all these things. Some Christians only have knowledge. They just study the Bible. Some Christians have a lot of willpower to endure temptation and just talk about holy living all the time. And these things are good, but you also need charity. You need to care about other Christians. And you need to show it. In 1 Corinthians 13, 9, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. On this earth we can know a little bit. That is, what God has revealed to us through the Word of God. We know a little bit about the future and can say things are going to happen that we read about in the Bible. But there are things that we have no idea about. An infinite amount of things. Ephesians 3, 8 says, Unto me who am less than the least of all, of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Google couldn't hold the amount of information that God knows. It couldn't hold accounts of the events that would take place in eternity. It's not that big. It's not big enough. Romans eleven thirty three says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So we know in part, we know a little bit, but verse 10 says, But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So that which is perfect isn't referring to the completion of the New Testament, even though the Bible is perfect. It's actually referring to the return of Jesus Christ. When that which is perfect is come. The one that's perfect that's come is Jesus Christ. You say, well, that's false because it says that which is perfect. You say if it was Jesus, then it would say that who is perfect. But that's not necessarily true. Look at this in 1 John 1, 1. It says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Also look at Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. So the way it's worded isn't a problem. That which is perfect is Jesus. Just like I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Just like that which was from the beginning. So you think it's referring to the completion of the New Testament, but look at what you're saying. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 10, it says, for, for we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. It says, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. If that which is perfect referred to the Bible being complete, then you wouldn't know in part. You would know it all, but you don't. You don't know it all. We don't even know all of what the Bible has for us yet. So this can't be referring to the New Testament being complete. It's referring to when Jesus Christ comes back. At that point, we will have glorified bodies. We'll have went to the judgment seat of Christ, been in heaven, and had a marriage supper with him. So for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So if if that which was perfect was the Bible, 
then that which is in part should be, should be done away. It's not come yet. Jesus hasn't come yet. So you don't have the mind of Christ yet. That which is in part has not been done away. So that could, it couldn't be the Bible. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. We don't have much understanding when it comes to these things yet. It's like, think back when you were a kid. You didn't understand things, but now you understand. And you look back and say, how did I not understand all that? It's because your mind couldn't get it yet. You may not know a lot of Bible now compared to a lot of people in the world, but you still know more than you knew. You know nothing compared to God, and you know... You don't you don't have the mind of Christ yet, but you do. If you continue studying, you're going to know more next year than you did at this point. So you should just continuously study, continuously read the Bible, continuously memorize the Bible, and in a year, you'll know more than you knew right now. Right now, you may be a babe in Christ. You understand as a child. But you need to become a man when it comes to the Bible. Get into the meat of the word. And 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Notice the then face to face. Further proving that when that which is perfect has come, refers to a time when you'll be in a time where you see and look at Jesus Christ square in the face face to face right now we see through a glass darkly james 1 23 if any be a hearer of the word and not not a doer he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass we see through the lens of the bible but god hasn't revealed it all to us yet we see through a glass darkly verse 12 but now we see through a glass darkly but then face to face now i know in part but then shall i know even as also i am known so god knows you and you know you. The only person who knows you better than you is God. But when you have glorified bodies, you'll know yourself and you'll know everyone else around you. A Christian who died 200 years ago is someone you'll know more than you know a familiar friend right now. You're going to have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Now by the faith, hope, charity, faith. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity is the greatest of these because there is coming a time when faith and hope are fulfilled. Right now we are saved by grace through faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. But when I see Jesus Christ face to face, I'll no, no, I'll no longer need faith. Jesus Christ is my blessed hope. But when it gets me at the rapture, my hope has come. But charity will go on out into eternity. So the greatest of these is charity. And that is what is lacking in these last days.